Hello, my name is Mike Henderson, and I'm an assistant professor of NML Institute in Grand Rapids. And today I'll be discussing recent work from my lab and others tracking alpha synuclein pathology. I wanted to thank the Defeat MSA Alliance for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today and note that the views I present today do not reflect the views of Defeat MSA. My group investigates the underlying pathogenesis of neurodegenerative disease and leverages that knowledge to develop and evaluate therapeutics for these devastating diseases. One of the ways we do this is by closely and quantitatively examining pathologies associated with disease, and that is what I'm going to talk with you about today. So today I'm going to discuss the pathology of multiple system atrophy and Parkinson's disease and evidence that the pathology in these diseases spreads from cell to cell. I'll then tell you about one of my projects in which we developed methods for, to track alpha synuclein pathology as it spreads through the brain. And I'll finish up by exploring how the basic science work we're doing in my lab relates to clinical neurodegenerative disease. So what are the pathologies present in multiple system atrophy and in Parkinson's disease? It's useful to compare Parkinson's disease and MSA because they're both characterized by misfolding of the neuronal protein called alpha synuclein. While PD is initially a motor disorder, MSA is characterized by movement and autonomic disturbances. PD affects approximately 1% of the population, while MSA affects a smaller percentage. Both PD and MSA patients accumulate alpha synuclein aggregates, but these aggregates are in distinct cells and in distinct areas. The brain is composed of gray matter and white matter. Gray matter contains neurons, which do the computation of the brain, and the white matter contains the axons of those neurons, allowing them to communicate with other regions of the brain. White matter also contains glia that wrap around axons of neurons, enabling them to communicate more quickly. In Parkinson's disease, we find the accumulation of alpha synuclein Lewy bodies and neurites within neurons in the gray matter shown on the left in brown. While in MSA, we find alpha synuclein in gliocytoplasmic inclusions in the white matter. But there's something a bit curious about gliocytoplasmic inclusions, which I'll discuss on the next slide. Here on the left, I've schematized the brain to show the neurons in gray matter and their axons and glia in the white matter. The glia we're most interested in are called oligodendrocytes because these harbor the gliocytoplasmic inclusions of MSA. But here's the curious part. Alpha synuclein is only expressed in neurons, specifically in these presynaptic specializations of neurons. Alpha synuclein is not actually expressed in these glia. So what happens to alpha synuclein during disease? What we know is that in cells, something triggers alpha synuclein to misfold and aggregate into long snake-like inclusions in neurons, known as Lewy neurites, and large inclusions in the cell body known as Lewy bodies. Further, we think that alpha synuclein can actually escape from one neuron and be internalized by a nearby neuron, causing misfolding and Lewy body formation in that neuron. This is what's known as cell-to-cell -cell transmission or spread. So what happens in MSA? How do these cells that don't normally express alpha synuclein get alpha synuclein pathology? We think that cell to cell spread may also explain how oligodendrocytes can get pathology. When misfolded alpha synuclein is released, oligodendrocytes may grab it, and in some cases, they may not have the ability to degrade misfolded alpha synuclein, leading to a pathological cascade in oligodendrocytes. So, what is the evidence for the cell-to-cell -cell spread of pathological alpha synuclein? Some of the evidence comes from staging of alpha synuclein pathology in postmortem Parkinson's disease brains done by a neuropathologist named Heiko Brock. While we know that the substantia nigra is disrupted in Parkinson's disease, alpha synuclein pathology can actually be found earliest in the deep medulla and olfactory bulb, two areas of the brain that are directly connected to the body. Later, pathology is found in the brainstem, eventually in the vulnerable substantia nigra, and then as disease progresses throughout many of the cortical areas of the brain that control cognitive function. This suggested to Heiko Brock and others that pathology is actually spreading through the brain over time. Of course, 
They didn't know at the time how this pattern emerged and whether spread actually occurred through axonal connections. A second line of evidence of cell-to-cell -cell spread comes from therapeutic experiments pursued in Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease patients lose dopaminergic neurons, which leads to motor dysfunction. One treatment researchers have pursued is replacing that lost dopamine by taking L-DOPA orally. However, fluctuations can occur with oral medication. And so one alternative strategy was to add fetal dopaminergic neurons directly into the patient brain and allow those neurons to directly replace lost neurons. While this strategy has worked for some patients, one remarkable finding is that these grafted neurons actually develop Lewy bodies after 11 to 15 years, something that would not happen in 15-year-old neurons in a healthy brain. <clears throat> this suggests that either the environment is so toxic it causes alpha synuclein to misfold in these cells, or nearby neurons are transferring their misfolded alpha synuclein to the grafted neurons. So why does it matter if pathology spreads through the brain? I want to emphasize here that there's no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission of pathological alpha synuclein. While many of the terms I use may sound similar to transmission of a virus, for example, this is not a health concern. We're only interested in cell-to-cell -cell transmission within one person. But within one person, cell-to-cell -cell spread is incredibly interesting because this means pathology is actually going outside of the cell at some point. While this may not sound like a big deal, it's actually a huge deal for therapeutic development. And here I'll describe some of those new avenues. The first of these is that the brain has a built-in method of getting rid of proteins that are outside of the cell. And this is called lymphatic clearance. If we can stimulate this pathway, we may be able to reduce cell-to-cell -cell spread. The second option is immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is a method of immunizing the body against pathogens. This usually only works against proteins like viruses that live outside of cells. So we now think that we may be able to use it to clear toxic alpha-synuclein from the body if that alpha-synuclein becomes extracellular. In fact, several immunotherapies targeting alpha-synuclein are now in clinical trials. Another form of therapies is targeted against glia because we think these cells, including oligodendrocytes and MSA, are important mediators of neurodegeneration. There may also be certain receptors on the outside of the cell that allow alpha-synuclein to be internalized. If we block those receptors, perhaps we can stop spread. And finally, the cell-to-cell -cell spread hypothesis has suggested that disease may actually start in peripheral organs, including the gastrointestinal tract in Parkinson's disease and in the bladder in MSA. These would be excellent therapeutic targets since they're much more accessible than the brain. So I've given you the current evidence of cell-to-cell -cell spread and told you why we care about it. This is where disease models become important because they allow us to ask questions like, does alpha synuclein pathology actually spread through the brain? If so, in which direction and what cells are vulnerable to developing pathology? We can test these questions with a mouse model of alpha synucleinopathy. It turns out that alpha synuclein is the type of protein that is natively unfolded. That means it doesn't have a conformation on its own and that makes it very prone to aggregate. So if we simply purify it and shake it in a tube for a week, it'll form these elongated fibrils. We can then inject those fibrils directly into the brains of mice, and it's taken up by cells and induce, induces the misfolding of the alpha synuclein that's already in the brains of those mice into aggregates that look very much like the Lewy bodies in human disease. Now we can ask those long-standing questions. Does pathology spread through neuronal connections? If so, in which direction? and what cells are most vulnerable. To understand spread at the whole brain level, we must quantify pathology throughout the brain. My lab did this using manual annotation of 172 regions of the brain, and thereafter performed automated quantification in all those regions. To give you an idea of what this looks like, these are brown Lewy body inclusions in the substantia nigra of an injected mouse. When we zoom out, you may see pathology in several other regions, we can use, uh, we can then annotate regions and apply a quantitative detection method in red and yellow. Here, 
And we can also selectively look at Lewy bodies, as shown here in red. When we do this, we can measure pathology through the brain over time. We can then plot those measures as a heat map on the brain, as shown here with red uh, color denoting regions that have a lot of pathology. At one month, we already have pathology in many regions. At three months, pathology is already increased and spread to the opposite side of the brain. And by six months post-injection, much of the brain is infected. This was very exciting because we can examine for the first time at a brain-wide level how pathology progresses through the brain. When we plot these quantitative measures out for different brain regions, we can begin to discern the temporal patterns of spread. Regions like the injection site and hippocampus have almost linear increases in pathology over time, while regions that are not directly connected to the injection site show a delayed to pathology onset. Other regions which have high connectivity show robust pathology early and no further accumulation over time. The pattern seen in the substantia nigra and other loci where there's a rapid increase followed by a rapid decrease is indicative, at least in the case of the nigra, of neuronal death. Finally, some regions never accumulate more than a cell or two over the entire six months. So we now have quantitative measures of pathology through space and time. But if you're keeping track, I've still not answered the question I posed. Does alpha synuclein pathology spread through the neurons in the brain? To answer that question, we needed to do some math. If we know how much pathology is in one region, can we predict how much pathology should spread from that region all the regions connected to it. Drs. Danny Bassett and Eli Kornblath are computational neuroscientists, and this type of question is their bread and butter. So Eli built a mathematical model that would predict the hypothetical spread of pathological alpha synuclein along all of these neuronal connections shown here. And all we had to do was compare those predictions to our actual pathology measures. In these plots, each dot is a region, and the predicted amount of pathology Eli generated is on the x-axis, and our actual pathology levels are on the y-axis. I hope you can appreciate that the model did a pretty good job of predicting pathology over these three separate time points. We also found using this model that pathology spreads mostly in one direction, from the axon back towards the cell body. Another advantage of this network model is that it's not limited by our real world physics. We don't merely have to follow it forward in time. We can reverse the clock and find out where pathology started. If we do that, we can predict the site of pathology initiation with excellent accuracy. Here we see that pathology was initiated in a region called the Cotopotamin, which is where we actually injected the mice. We can also ask our model, what would happen if pathology started in a different region of the brain? For example, what if pathology started in the olfactory or smell sensing part of the brain? Our model tells us that if we, uh, that we will get a pathology pattern that looks like this on the top with the piriform cortex affected most strongly, but with substantial spread to the opposite side of the brain and sparing of some of these subcortical regions. Is this prediction useful? We compared it to work done by Patrick Brundon's lab following an olfactory bulb injection. You can appreciate, I hope, that we have almost completely recapitulated the pathology pattern that they observed in that independent study. One thing you may notice about our predictions is they're not perfect. If they were, all the regions would line up along a thick green line. But this is actually a huge benefit of modeling because we can now see which regions are more vulnerable than we would expect in which regions are more resilient. That is, they don't get pathology when the model predicts that they should. What this means is we can now generate quantitative measures of vulnerability in the brain. I've plotted these out here with red regions being the vulnerable ones and blue regions being the resilient ones. We see an interesting pattern where the frontal regions are more vulnerable to pathology and the thalamic regions are more resilient. When we compare that to alpha synuclein gene expression, we find that much of the vulnerability to pathology can be explained by expression of this one gene, where there's high expression of alpha synuclein in the frontal regions and low expression in these thalamic regions 
explaining why they're less vulnerable to pathology. In conclusion, I showed you that alpha synuclein can misfold into disease causing forms. That misfolded alpha synuclein can move from cell to cell, leading to disease progression. We've now developed methods to track and predict the spread of pathology and regional vulnerability. And that spread is largely from the axon back towards the cell body. What we've not yet discussed is where oligodendrocytes fit in. Well, oligodendrocytes are much less studied than neurons, but we're beginning to learn more about how they get pathology. If you take that same mouse model that I described and age them longer, one to one and a half years, they don't only have neuronal pathology anymore. Gliocytoplasmic inclusions begin to form. This is the nucleus in the oligodendrocyte on the left, and you can see an alpha synuclein aggregate wrapping around it. This pathology is consistent with the notion that oligodendrocytes can get pathology from cell to cell transmission from neurons. Further, once oligodendrocytes have alpha synuclein pathology, the pathology formed in those cells seems to have a much higher ability to spread from cell to cell. Here, neurons were treated with lab made alpha synuclein in the top left, or alpha synuclein from MSA, Parkinson's disease. Alzheimer's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies at the same concentration. You can appreciate visually that this MSA alpha synuclein is somehow much more potent, inducing much more pathology than the other uh, alpha synuclein from the other diseases. Together, these studies support the notion that alpha synuclein can spread from cell to cell, even cells like oligodendrocytes that don't express alpha synuclein itself. Further, when oligodendrocytes get pathology, for reasons we don't know yet, it's much more pathogenic. Something my lab thinks constantly about is, are the processes that we study in model systems the same as what is happening in humans? What I can say with regards to spreading is that several studies have now used the exact same type of mathematical model we used to estimate disease progression in Parkinson's disease brain or in Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia. They have uniformly found that disease progresses through the brain connections. Imaging in disease may therefore be useful for estimating prognosis and identifying locations in the brain that are most amenable to therapeutic intervention. Where does this knowledge leave us? We've learned so much, but there are many more important questions left to answer. What makes certain cells vulnerable to degeneration? Why are oligodendrocytes vulnerable in MSA? Can we reinforce vulnerable cells to make them resistant to developing pathology? Can we find the location where disease starts and stop it there? And can we use therapeutics to slow or stop the progression of disease? I wanna thank you for your attention and conclude by acknowledging my former mentor, Dr. Virginia Lee, who developed the misfolded alpha synuclein model I used for my studies and Danny and Eli, who did all the computational modeling I showed you today. This work was also partially supported by the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and I look forward to answering any questions you all may have.